Number six is practice 80 for 20. Now, my fourth observation, every perfectionist I've met in P&G has a work-life balance issue problem because they don't know when to stop. Now, everything in life is a double-edged sword. If you're a perfectionist, that's wonderful, but the sword cuts both ways. You also don't know when to stop. And you've got to decide, and we're in a company, we're in a business that's often imprecise, and it's an art, not a science. There are times in life you've got to go to 100%, but there's a lot of times in our business where you can stop at 80. If you're a perfectionist, I'm not, so I've never had to worry about this, but if you're a perfectionist, you have to be in touch with your perfectionism and know when you've got to back off. Because it can take you one month to get to 80%, it takes us two months to get to 90, and it takes three to get to 100. It's the law of diminishing returns. The more you invest to get past 80, the more it's disproportionately painful to get there. If you're a perfectionist, you've got to ask yourself a simple question. Is what I'm working on an 80 for 20 good enough? If the answer is no, take it to 100. Yesterday I met with R&D folks. I said, I know in your business often you have to be 100% precise. I know that. Marketing folks can be much more 80 for 20 because they don't have the data to be so precise. But I know in R&D world you may have to do that. That's okay. But even in your world it can be sometimes 80 for 20 is good enough. If the answer is yes to the first question, which is, is this an 80 for 20 decision? Then the second one is, is then, do you know where 80% is and are you prepared to be disciplined to stop when you're at 80% ready? If you can do this, you'll, you'll add a lot of time. Number seven is training your people. Jim observation number five. We have a group of people in P&G who are these one-man machines, one woman, one-man machines. Their personal productivity is breathtaking. They get everything done. But you know, they never take time to train their organizations. They're always having like two and two minus rated people work for them. And they're always complaining that they don't get the best people. And nobody ever seems to thrive under them. These people are always workaholics and they're always sick. And they're always coughing phlegm up. It's a standard thing. They're always hacking up phlegm. And the reason is, is that they're working themselves to the bone all the time and that they don't train their people, so they've always got to cover for them because their people aren't good, their people aren't doing it, they don't, and they don't trust them, and so they're always into it, and they get into another vicious cycle. They're, most people that join this company are two-rated. A one is made by great training. Uh, there, occasionally, we will get a Michael Jordan walk in the door who was really born to do this job, but the vast majority of ones here are made. Great coaches take twos and make them into ones. Getting a Michael Jordan and then saying, I, I've got a one-rated person, don't take credit for it. Okay, that's not being a great coach. All you did was did not screw it up. <laughs> great coaches take twos and make them ones. But when people are surrounded by twos, I've had many managers come and say, all I have are twos. I said, yeah, do your job now and make some ones out of them. Don't come and cry to me. That's called training. It's called hard work. You know, going around and only cherry picking everybody else's Michael Jordans is not like saying I'm a great coach. You're, you're a pathetic coach because you're doing the lazy way out. Train your people. When you get great people underneath you who are thriving, this opens up all kinds of avenues for your own personal productivity because you don't have to do everybody else's job. People ask me all the time, why do you train so much? I probably train like five days a month because it's the best use of my time. I have 3,000 employees in the Philippines. What am I going to do everybody's job? The best thing I can do is go around and train. The best thing I can do for my own work-life balance is to train like crazy because that will then in turn unleash people. Because you know, as David Taylor always says, and it's a smart statement, nobody is smarter than everybody. But we have people who really believe it, that they are the centerpiece of it all, that the, they are the sun of the solar system and everything revolves around them and they gotta do everybody else's job. And they get into this vicious cycle and the vicious cycle is my people aren't good but I gotta now do their job and because I gotta do their job I have no time to train them. These people become demotivated because they're good PNG people who want to contribute and they know that they're not contributing to their maximum, so they're frustrated and up, upset. They're also not getting any better because they don't get any training. And the cycle just continues. Because of that, they don't deliver, so the boss has to step in more. You want to get free of stuff, train your people. It takes some investment, but you got to do it. Having a top-rated person that you've built is the greatest feeling in the world. It's also not only personally satisfying, but it takes so much stress off of your hands. Number eight, 30 minutes of exercise a day. <clears throat> now, 
Here's a data point for you. The key to sleep is the speed at which you enter REM stage four sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. That is when you get deep restful sleep. Okay, that's why when you hit the snooze button, it's always worse off because you don't have time to get back into the REM sleep. And so you're actually more tired when you hit a snooze button after you sleep for the extra nine minutes because you're only in stage one that leaves you even more groggy. The real restful sleep is REM sleep, which is stage four. You can't get into that on a snooze button. The worst thing you can do is hit snooze buttons. You'll be worse off. When it goes, you gotta get up. Now, what happens is, is the more physically fit you are, the faster the body will enter stage four sleep, which means you may need less time of total sleep because you'll spend more time in stage four. The average data on this and you can go and Google it if you want, you'll find it, is for every 30 minutes of exercise a day that's done consistently, you'll reduce your needs for sleep by 60 minutes. That's why when people always tell me they never have time to exercise, I always kind of laugh because they can't see the forest through the trees. You know, when I was a 260 pound plus guy, I had to have a minimum seven and a half to eight a night, and only nine would get me feeling good. I can't sleep seven now if my life depends on it. And I am so rested at seven and most nights at six. And I can go weeks at a time on five and feel fine. It's amazing once you're fit how restful my sleep is. I hit the pillow, I'm out. I'm, I'm pretty quickly into REM sleep and I wake up completely ref ref um, refreshed. I've picked up at least an hour and a half a day by being consistently exercising. But the rule of thumb we'll stick to is for 30 minutes in, it's 60 minutes reduction in sleep.